Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Tim Lintner. I'm a professor here in the School of Education at USC Aiken. I want to spend some time talking about a very important, very poignant, and somewhat controversial historical figure that um, certainly has his place within American education. Certainly he has his place within early forms of sociology and anthropology, particularly he resonates today when we're talking about educational disparity and we're talking about notions of educational access. And I think Du Bois was really on point more than a century ago, thinking about how do we educate all and particularly how do we educate African Americans and we'll talk about some kind of statistical disparities. But really he remains still controversial to this day because as we're going to talk about this notion of the talented 10th, was that enough? Was it enough? Was it a start? Was it good enough? Where do we position Du Bois now in 2023? And can we take a look at him in light of Booker T. Washington, who I'm going to reference a little bit throughout this as well, and, and kind of juxtapose their, their conflicting ideologies about African-American education, and how can we situate both Du Bois and Booker T. Washington again within a contemporary lens? So let's get started. So it's interesting to note that, and we need to remember that Du Bois was born free. He was born after the Civil War in Massachusetts, which obviously in the North was a, a free state. That's going to resonate, and, and I want us to remember that. It's not going to overshadow what he thought or what he did, but it does add a layer of complexity, and it lends, lends an air uh, or a, a, an image of, of, um, of kind of intrigue with, did he have a different perspective never once knowing what it was like to be a slave? Now, clearly he understood the restrictions the societal assumptions of being African-American, even if he was born in the progressive North, particularly Massachusetts, but he wasn't born a slave. Clearly the man showed exceptional academic talent. His parents did not have the means to provide him a college education. Of course, formal education was part and parcel in Massachusetts forever, but what happened was that was really interesting is that the community lived in a very small community. The community of African Americans came together and said, look, this young man has talent. He needs to get out of this town. He needs to go to college. He needs to rise above. And they pooled their money together for him to attain several college degrees, ultimately receiving a PhD from Harvard, which isn't shabby. Um, and went back and taught at several universities. So he is a man of exceptional academic talent, African-American in you know the, the turn of the latter part of the 1800s. Here he is at Harvard, the first African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard. So no one can take away his intellectual prowess. And he takes this intellectual skill and prowess that he has he starts scratching his head and he says, I was uplifted by my community. They rallied to support me as I worked my way to and through school. How can I in turn take what I have been given and rally my race, right? Rally the African-American community writ large. It's really kind of at the heart of what Du Bois is trying to, to do uh, with his education. And it is exceedingly noble. He's looking around the landscape and he's saying, this doesn't feel right. It doesn't look right. Why don't I see more folks like me? Why don't I see more African-American men? Why don't I see virtually any African-American women receiving college degrees? How are we going to change the educational landscape as African-Americans? Remember, y'all, we're still talking about hardcore segregation. Even if it's not on the, the legal books, it's alive and living in the North and in the South. And, and Du Bois is challenging that dynamic of division, particularly when it comes to an education and clearly the disparity between educational outcomes of African-American kids going to school, quote, 
and white folks, white kids going to schools. Completely, completely different. So here kind of situates Du Bois within the context of his upbringing and his, his privilege by going to college and then that sense of, of giving back, that sense of communal commitment. How am I gonna give back to my community? So really this is kind of the ideal of, of Du Bois, right? He looks at the African-American community, says, this is what it should be. Now, I know that you're looking at this image and you're going, well, I mean, it still looks kind of rough. You have to contextualize this image. We're talking post-Civil War, probably the antebellum, right? Post-Civil War South. But when you look at these four African-American folks, they are well-dressed. They're presenting well. They, they have, quote, made it, and I really want us to be careful with that that term, made it, because I, they, right, I mean, it's, it's contextual, isn't it? But when you look at an image like this, you look at, it's uplifting, isn't it? Yes, you can see a bit of squalor in, in the back, but let's be frank, they have, I would imagine, a, you know, a wood-sided house. They have a house and they are dressed well, they're presenting well, that sense of, of affluence, that sense of I've made it. And this is really the ideal that Du Bois is after. He's, he's after inculcating in his African-American community this sense of success, this sense of achievement, this, this sense of look at us now, we are not living in squalor. We are not picking cotton. We are not being someone's slave. We are independent. We are free. We are uplifted. We are participatory in our community to the extent that communities would allow them to. But really, again, this is what Du Bois wanted. This is the model, the uplifting. And yes, I know that we're kind of contextualizing this by by defining uplifting as the way African-American folks are presented. But this is the start of Du Bois's conversation. It's, we need to collectively African-American community, we need to start raising ourselves by which we are moving away from the stereotypical squalor and the stereotypical slave master relationship by which we are autonomous and we are free to choose and we are free to do. But this image, particularly in the South, after the Civil War, this is real. So you look at Du Bois and he goes, here's the dream, right? The dream is to be well-dressed. The dream is to be educated. The dream is to be free. The dream is to be autonomous. The dream is to be self-serving, loosened from the shackles of, of, of confinement, right? And then here is the reality, particularly in the South. Folks after the Civil War are still picking cotton. And, and the disparity in the dress, the disparity in, in, in the access of what the previous slide had, <coughs> excuse me, slide had, and what these African American folks had, completely different. And it's interesting because Du Bois came down to the South, right? He's in Atlanta and he's in the bowels of Georgia. And remember, y'all, he's, he's from the North. He's never experienced slavery. He doesn't know what it's like. And he's writing uh, The Souls of Black Folks, right? And he's down in the South and he's looking at images like this of African-American folks in the 1890s, early 1900s. And this is still the image and he's scratching his head and he's confused. He's going, hang on a second. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. This isn't the way it is where, quote, I come from, even though he taught in, in Georgia at Fisk, right? So he, or he taught in Atlanta at Fisk. So he, he knew the confines of the South, but when he traveled outside of Atlanta into the deep, deep, deep rural Georgia, this is what he sees and he's confounded and he's confused. And so you really have this division of what life is supposed to be for African Americans after the Civil War. And yes, it is geographical. The North much more progressive 
the South much more conservatory and constricting of the possibilities for African American, uh, African American general and particularly African American students to to receive an education. What does that education look like? Because I'm looking at this image, and I see a number of African American kids who are not in school. What are the possibilities for them? What's the potential for them? How are they going to move out of this bondage? And that's what Du Bois is about. He's about finding ways to free African Americans from this image. But he's really, really conflicted. He's really confused about what, what am I supposed to do? How does this work, right? What, this, this, this just doesn't seem right. And his work becomes doubly hard. So Friedman School, right? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Friedman School in a second. So here's kind of this, this situational statistic of where we are with African-Americans before the Civil War. 15% of African-Americans were literate. That's not hopeful at all, right? We know intuitively that African-Americans have been denied virtually everything in our history. Um, particularly in terms of an education, whatever that education looks like. And what we have found that a number of African Americans, particularly Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass, were taught how to read and write by the slave mistress, right? The wife of the plantation owner who would take certain African American students or children, quote, of promise and typically she would teach them how to read and write. Remember, literacy is the most powerful tool we have. We have the ability to read and write. You have the ability to read and write. You have a power that not everybody has. And, and it's always been, education has always been that, that coveted space by which I have it, you don't, so I'm going to keep you ignorant and literate because I want to have power over you. That's as, that's as old as the hills. That's been going on for thousands of years. And for a lot of slave owners, that's one of the reasons why they clearly would never give their African-American slaves the opportunity to become, to become literate is because then they can challenge. Once you can read a document, once you can read and, and understand, you can raise your hand and argue. And that was never, ever going to happen. But for the mistresses of the house, it, it wasn't about power. It wasn't about, I don't want you to read. It was more rooted in faith. It was rooted in this notion of, um, of uplifting, but it's so small and it was so hit or miss. And look, 15% of African-Americans were literate. That's... It, it, so you're having 85% of a particular race that, that has no access, that is virtually kept out of the, the literacy or the literate loop, and it's purposeful. So how do we change this dynamic after the Civil War? So the introduction of Freedmen schools, and there are a number of Freedmen schools here in South Carolina. There were in South Carolina, one down in... Um, down in the low country that was just revolutionary. So by the beginning of the 20th century, right? 1900s, only 2000 African Americans had received a college education. So how do we move kids? Look, look, y'all, this is a one room schoolhouse. That's all that it is. And there are a number of African American kids, but you see right in the front, an African American male who's sitting in the chair. He is the head teacher. So how do we move our African-American youth? Heretofore, remember, only 15% of all African-Americans were literate. So how do we move this whole new generation post-Civil War of African-American kids? How do we move them through the educational pipeline by which college is the anticipated stepping stone? Right, it's not just receive a cursory education, three years, four years, you're marginally literate and you're good enough. Yes, that certainly did happen. But for Du Bois, that wasn't good enough. It, it, it needed to be much more focused, it needed to be much more 
systematic, right, an educational pipeline like we have now, right, K through 12, and then on to college if you choose to or not, but at least that, that K through 12 pipeline, that didn't exist at the turn of the 1900s. There wasn't any kind of pipeline per se, particularly for African and Americans. There just wasn't the access. And here's Du Bois by saying, look, college is the goal. College is the goal. It, it has to be. We have to have the most educated group, educated cadre of African Americans to go back into their community and uplift it through education. So it's, there's no surprise, it's not surprising that there were very few African-American teachers when only 15% of the African-Americans were literate. It took years and years to build this sense of literacy, to build this educational pipeline for African-American kids. Remember y'all, we're still again talking segregation. There, there's, there's, there's no mingling of the races here. So for the white folks, completely different educational dynamic. For the, the black folks, African-American folks, a, a different, completely different complex and convoluted set of hurdles awaited them. So really Du Bois is saying the only way that we are going to uplift an entire race is through education. And the only way in an era of segregation that we, the African-American community, are going to uplift ourselves is if we create teachers who have gone through the educational pipeline, have gone to college and go back into their community to serve. And this is, this is really admirable, right? But can you, can you see the limitations? Can, can you see how many universities are accepting African-American folks in the 1900s? How many African-American folks are literate enough, right? Again, that pipeline to go back into their community and serve it. Very, very few. And I would just want to take a quick minute to juxtapose this against um, Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington, another African American stalwart, was born into slavery. Booker T. Washington was a slave on a plantation as a child. He knew what it was like to work and to toil and to torment day after day after day. After the Civil War, Booker T. Washington has roughly the same ideal, right, as DuBose by saying we need to increase educational access for our, our particular race. Booker T. Washington goes about it in a different way, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time about Booker T. Washington because this is more about, about Du Bois. but it's a really interesting parallel between these two stalwarts of African-American education and the different kind of perspectives that they took. Booker T. Washington says, look, I get it. We're still living in a segregated South. We're still living in a segregated North. We're still living under oppression. Jim Crow is alive and living, right? He's not, he doesn't have the ideal. He says, look, yes, we, a, a segregated schoolhouse is fine. We'll take it. It's better than what we had. We will take it. Yes, we need to invest in infrastructure. Yes, we need to develop more teachers. But we're, we're really, the goal of education was to get a trade for, 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 for Booker T. Washington. He said, look, if we can train our race to be carpenters, plumbers, um, you know, farriers, um, yeah. agricultural farmers, right? That is good enough. We need to start somewhere. We need to start by which at least if I am an African American carpenter, I have a skill, I have a trade, I can make money, I can join a particular uh, company, I can create my own company, I can do my own work, but I have an education, I have a trade, I have a skill, that makes me autonomous and it makes me money. And I don't need to go to college for that. I, I can go kind of the apprentice route, which obviously very, very popular back then for black folks and for white folks as well. And he, and he said, that's, that's good enough. I, I, you know, college is a dream, college is wonderful, but the only way, this is Washington, the only way that we are going to uplift the African-American race is if folks have a skill, a trade to do, by which they are educated, 
they perform their trade, they are autonomous to do so, and they earn their own money. Du Bois says, not good enough. Get it? Great. But we need to shoot a little higher. So here you have, again, these, these different ideals where Du Bois is saying, uh-uh, we're going to go all the way to college. College is the only way. We need to have the most educated folks to go back into their communities. They're going to serve as the teachers. They're going to build up the educational workforce of local communities. And, and Booker T. Washington is saying, uh, that is so unrealistic. We just need to get give people jobs, give them skills, give them jobs so they are performers and they can earn their own wage. Really, really interesting dynamic. It, it really divided a lot of the African-American community and it divided certainly the white community because the white community is saying, look, we really don't want to give you both. Certainly not a college education. Um, you know, if you have to be a carpenter, great, but whatever. It was, it was just a, a very stark dichotomy between what role does education play in the uplifting of an entire race. So here we have this notion of the talented 10th. 10%, that's all Du Bois wanted. And we'll talk about that in a second. 10% of the African-American males. And we'll talk about that in a second, right? So you look at this picture of the talented 10th, African-American folks. This is probably 19, I don't know, 10, 20, 30. I mean, look at these guys, right? Educated, well-dressed, ready to move their community. This is Du Bois. So when Du Bois looks at this particular image, he sees himself. He sees an educated, astute, participatory, well-dressed, connected to the point that he could be, African-American male serving his particular community. This is the root of the talented 10th. When Booker T. Washington looks at this image, he does not see himself. He does not see his community represented in this particular image. But Du Bois is saying, again, the only way that we are going to raise our, our race out of this kind of educational stagnation is through the talented 10th. So here it is, right? The, the, the talented 10th, 10% of African-American males need to receive a quote, proper education, right? And proper means college. So he, he's just saying, look, if just one in 10 African-American men go to college, receive a college degree, they will go back into their community and they will transform their community through education, through economics, through politics. They will be the leaders. They will be the mirrors. They will be the drivers of African-American change within their community. And this, again, really strikes in contrast with Booker T. Washington's notion of uh, no, we don't need this. This is not what's going to uplift the Africa, African-American community. 10%? So Booker T. Washington's going 10%, right? That's not very much. Du Bois is saying it's something. It's a start. At least we're, we're, we're building a consensus around what it means to change a particular community. And, and what I want us to be really cognizant of is that this is more of a Northern reflection than possibly a Southern reflection. And this is situational. Du Bois was born in the North. He was not born a slave. For him, this kind of progressive ideology is part and parcel. Remember, the guy went to Harvard, right? It's, it's what you do. You, you rise up, you go to college, you go back into your community and you transform it. And, and, and Du Bois is, is that. He is part of the talented 10th. And he's advocating for more African-American males to go back to college, to continue through that educational pipeline that we talked about, and then move on to college and then go, go back into their community to be civic leaders. And Booker T. Washington is going, okay, just not going to happen, right? Just this isn't what we need to do. We need to get all our African-American men, particularly, a skill and a trade. We're not just lifting 
10%, we're trying to lift all of our African Americans to go back into the community, again, to be autonomous and to be, be wage earners. So here's, here's the, again, that, that sense of dichotomy. So let's critique Du Bois here a little bit. You know, you, you talk about Booker D. Washington, and he's saying, they, we don't need college. We don't need college. We don't need, we don't need Harvard, right? I, I need some tools. I need a, an, an apprentice. I need a mentor. I need um, land, and I will become self-sufficient ever as an African-American tradesperson. I will become self-sufficient. I will have my own set of skills that nobody can take away from me that I will not be reliant upon someone else to earn a living. It may not be the best living, it may not be the most glorious of jobs, and it may still be darn hard, but I'm working for myself. I'm giving back to my community because I am investing in my community. I am part of my African-American community, but I am now self-sufficient. And is that such a bad thing, right? So often, and particularly Du Bois, Du Bois said, oh my gosh, it's so limiting, right? And don't we still see these kind of comparative conversations in 2023? The difference between going to a tech school and earning a trade or going to college and earning a degree. And I say this all the time, right? You can go to a tech school to become, you know, a, an electrician and get certified in, in electricians, right? Um, and it's a year to your program. I, I just don't know. But anytime that your electricity goes out and you call that electrician, it's 120 bucks for them just to drive up in your driveway. So if you want to talk about trades that are extremely lucrative, they're there but you don't have a college degree. You don't need a college degree. You look at an auto mechanic, chances are they don't have a four-year degree. They went to a trade school or they apprenticed under somebody who taught them how to fix an engine. Your car breaks, you just slap down your credit card and you say, just fix it. They have a skill that certainly I don't have. I have a college degree, right? They have a skill that I don't have. I went to college but what, what's, what's the, the advantage? And this is what Washington is talking about. And we still talk about this in 2023. Oh, everybody needs to go to college. Everybody needs to go to college because college is the, the end ticket. And this is right out of Du Bois, right? College is the end ticket. And Washington is saying, no, folks just need to go to a tech school or a community college, get a trade, go back out, earn a living. And we, we tend to kind of eschew on our tech school partners because it's not college, but it's a trade and it's a living. So we have um, this, this notion of, of limitation, right? Um, du Bois, talented 10th, 10% of the African-American men were going to, to go to college. Where are they gonna go? We're looking at 1900, 1910, 1920s. Remember, colleges are still segregated by and large. So they definitely are segregated, right? There are a number of historically black colleges and universities for folks to go to, and there are a number in the South. That's a limiting factor as well. If you cannot get to that individual school, you're not going to college. If you can't travel to that individual's college, you're not going because it's not like we have, like in South Carolina, what are there, like 30 different colleges for us to choose from. It's not like that in the 1900s, 1910s, 20s, and 30s. It's not. There are very, very, very few historically black colleges and universities. And that's where you went. So Du Bois has this, this grandiose ideal that every, you know, 10%, all these men are going to be educated and they're going to go to college and they're going to go back into the, to the communities and they're going to be movers and shakers, which they certainly were. But just this notion of access, this notion of stereotype and bias, you know, why do you want to go to college? Why, what do you need college for as an African-American male? What, what, what good is it going to do you? Because remember, at this time, there's not a whole lot of folks that are going to college, black folks that are going to college. 
So you also have communities that are going, yeah, you don't need to go to college. You just need to stay here and work, right? I really need you to work rather than going off for four years. And Du Bois had this notion that that is the way that, that we, as a community, an African-American community, are going to raise ourselves up. Interestingly, for the ladies that are listening to this, you are not part of this conversation at all. You are not part of Du Bois's conversation. You're really not part of Booker T. Washington's conversation either. You are not included in this notion of being educated. You are still back in the child rearing, housekeeping, due diligence model of, of female behavior. So one of the one of the lingering effects of Du Bois is that there was never a mention of women. There was never a mention of of 10% of men and 10% of women going back to college. You're going to college and then going back into the community. And that is such a limiting factor of Du Bois, in my opinion, such a limiting factor of Du Bois's conversation is that there were numbers of talented African American women that would give anything to go to college that had the intellectual ability to go to college to go back to their community and absolutely transform it arguably in ways that men could never do du bois never once uh, petitioned for african-american women to be part of this conversation and maybe let's be frank let's give him a little bit of benefit here Maybe he knew that that was never going to work, right? The the turn of you know, coming into the nineteenth turn of the twentieth century, the early nineteen hundreds. You know, really, women, black and white, were um, were just not given the same opportunities as men were at all, and there were hindrances for black and white women to to receive college. Now, of course, white women went to college at infinitely greater numbers than than black women did i mean that's just part of the conversation unfortunately but there's a missing segment here in du bois's conversation there's there's a missing group there's a missing talent pool that that wasn't tapped into and again maybe du bois is saying look it just wasn't realistic to to advocate for women to be part of this transformative opportunity we were ju we just weren't there yet we weren't there yet as a country to think that women were eligible were entitled to what men only heretofore possessed and that was a college education so again we can look at du bois a little bit differently on on the issue of women was he exclusionary? Absolutely. Did he, could he have pushed for more African-American women to be part of this talented tent? Absolutely. Was he astute to the political, economic, social landscape of his time that really restricted all women from going to college? I think he was as well. Did his notion of uh, a progression skew his notion of the talented tenth. He was never a slave. He was born in the progressive North. Did he think that it all should work like the progressive North? And again, there's a great story of Du Bois when he was writing The Souls of Black Folks. He, he got off a, a, a train in rural, rural Georgia and he's walking down this dirt road and he's he's just seeing wide open spaces, right? I mean, just forever, just open fields. And there's not a whole lot of people. And the folks that he run, runs into are African-American folks that after the Civil War are left with no other chance but to continue to work on the plantation or to acquire a, a couple of acres of their own because that's the only, quote, skill that they had. And Du Bois is talking to these folks and, you know, he, could you imagine, right? Here's his Harvard educated PhD. He's walking down this dusty road. He, he meets up with, and he tells the story. He meets up with a, a couple of African-American gentlemen that are riding in a, you know, a, a horse that's carrying this little buggy and there, you know, everybody's dusty, everybody's dirty, everybody's just unkempt except Du Bois, right? 
And he's looking at these African-American gentlemen and he's struggling with finding commonality. Here is a, 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 a northern educated, highly educated African-American man in the deep rural south of Georgia. And he's really trying to understand how can we move this dynamic? How can we move these two gentlemen from thinking that life in rural Georgia, in the bowels of some you know abandoned plantation, is good enough? And he and he does say in the Souls of Black Folks, I just didn't know what to say. I didn't have the the conversation. We were kind of missing our mark. And maybe this is inevitable when you look at where Du Bois came from and the, the cash, not C-A-S-H, but C-A-S-H-E, right? The cash that he brought with him, the education, the entitlement, the freedom. And he's trying to transpose that in a South that that wasn't the world down here. It wasn't what African-Americans experienced after the Civil War. It was still the experience of working, laboring for a living. And Du Bois is saying, we don't need to do that anymore. I'd be really interested to, to know what you think about Du Bois. He's still a critical figure. Folks are still debating, was he on the mark? Was he a trailblazer? Was he really progressively ahead of his time by advocating for college? You must be part of this intellectual community. You must join with our, our white brethren in, in going to universities to receive these higher degrees. And then you are challenged, this is Du Bois, and then you are challenged to go back into your community and be a teacher, be a politician, be a store owner, be a mayor, go back into your African-American community and transform it, particularly with education. Because remember what his call was initially was for the talented tenths to go back and be teachers, to take that college education and teach others how to be literate so they can follow in your footsteps to college. But I think the idea was a little bit more than that, it was really to just to be change agents in the African American community. Or do we kind of look at Du Bois and go, look, this is some guy who just didn't understand how things work, right? Um, and by his own admission, when he's talking to those two gentlemen in some dusty rural road in, in Georgia, he didn't understand. He tried to. But it was such a huge cultural, academic, social divide between Du Bois and these two gentlemen that it seemed insurmountable. Did he shoot too high? Was his ideal just too much? Was it too radical? Was it too forward thinking? Was it too unattainable? Because remember, we talked about there just weren't very many historically black colleges and universities for African Americans to literally go to at the time. He missed women. He never talked about women being part of this, this educational revolution. Was that a downfall? Or was he at least trying to push the African American race farther than it had ever been pushed before? Is that admirable? Did he misread the tea leaves? Possibly. Did he shoot for the stars? I think absolutely. I'd like to know what you think about W.E.B. Uh, -E -E du Bois. What, what, how do you situate yourself, giving, given what you know now about kind of his, his background, the, the, um, uh, you know, the context in which he was trying to make change? Was he a trailblazer? Was he a pawn? Was he a dreamer? Was he so far removed that he couldn't understand? What do you think about W.E.B. Du Bois? If you ever have an opportunity to read The Souls of Black Folk, Black Folk, it is a seminal, seminal read for anybody interested in education, anybody interested in sociology, anybody interested in, in anthropology at the turn of the 20th century and the early 1900s in the African-American community and how race was kind of constructed and, and sometimes misconstrued in America after the Civil War. It is just a brilliant, brilliant book that I recommend 
that if you have time that you should read. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for hanging in there. I appreciate it.